So let's take a look at atoms. So we start off each of these science videos with uh, several questions that we're going to try to uh, answer during the video. So uh, ionic and covalent bonding, being familiar with that. Um, uh, valence electrons, the uh, subshells. Um, understanding groups as uh, they fit into the uh, periodic table. If you're not familiar with that, we'll go over that. Um, average number of neutrons. How do we go about calculating that? And some stuff about isotopes. Okay. So as we get started here, just some basics. Um, elements are substances that cannot be broken down into other substances. Atoms are the smallest component of an element that retain the properties of that element. Molecules are two or more atoms that are bonded together. Atoms are made up of a nucleus and an orbital cloud that surrounds that nucleus. So we'll get into more into that here in a minute. Uh, neutrons are particles in the nucleus that have no electrical charge. Protons are positively charged particles in the nucleus. Electrons have a negative charge. Uh, you would like to know that neutrons and protons have about the same mass. As electrons orbit around the nucleus of an atom, opposite charges between protons and electrons create an attraction with the purpose of keeping the electrons in the orbital cloud. Okay, so kind of continuing on here with this introduction. Um, isotopes are variants of a particular chemical element which differ in neutron number. All isotopes of a given element have the same number of protons in each atom. Uh, the meaning behind the name is that different isotopes of a single element occupy the same position on the periodic table. And we'll be going into isotopes a little bit more here in a minute too. Uh, ions are atoms that are not electrically balanced because they have either added or lost electrons. And so within ions, we need to be familiar with the cations and the anions. So simply, a cation is the result of electrons being lost, and so it has a positive charge. An anion is the result of an atom having extra electrons, a negative charge. Okay, and then ionic and covalent bonds. So I think we had a question on ionic and covalent bonds. Let's go over them first and then we'll take a look at the question. Ionic bonds are a chemical bond formed between two ions with opposite charges. Ionic bonds form when one atom gives up one or more electrons to another atom. These bonds can form between a pair of atoms or between molecules and are the type of bond found in salts, for example. Okay, so ionic bonds, what we really want to hear there was two ions with opposite charges. We need at least to know that. Covalent bonding is when each atom shares a pair of electrons with each atom contributing one electron. Many organic compounds, such as carbohydrates, result from covalent bonding. Okay, so let's go back to the question. Pretty simple. All right, most of these questions really are pretty simple. What is the difference between ionic and covalent bonding? Okay, so with ionic bonds, the thing we wanted to remember was that we had two ions with opposite charges. Where with covalent bonding, when we said we have each atom shares a pair of electrons. Okay, so there's our first question. Okay, and then we jump into electron configuration. Okay, so each orbital can hold two electrons. And then we have these subshells. The sub S subshell contains one orbital and therefore can hold only two electrons. What next is the P subshell, which contains three orbitals and can hold six electrons. After that, the D subshell contains five orbitals and can hold 10 electrons. All right, I believe that also connects to a question. All right, so on that third bullet point, we see the P subshell contains blank orbitals. 
right? We want to know that the p subshell contains three orbitals and therefore can hold six electrons. Remembering that it's two electrons per orbital. Okay. And so when we write out the, the actual notation, which we're going to see here in a second, the first number is the shell. The letter that follows is the name subshell, and the superscript is the number of electrons in that subshell. Okay, so here's an example of that. So we're looking at sodium, which is atomic uh, number 11. And because so because of that, we, if it's number 11, then we know that it has 11 electrons, right? Okay, and as you write, see this formula down here, so we start off with 1s squared, <clears throat> and then we go 2s squared, 2p to the 6th, 3s to the 1st. And so if you add up the 2, the 2, the 6, and the 1, we get 11, right? So that's representing those, <clears throat> those 11 electrons. Okay, and then we'll go here even more specifically into an example, a different example. Okay, so this would be the electron configuration for potassium, right? And so potassium is atomic number 19, right? And again, now it's going to mean 19 electrons. We also need to know that in the first shell, there are two electrons in the S subshell. In the second shell, there's going to be two electrons in the S subshell, but six in the P subshell, right? We're, getting, we're trying to get this total all the way up to 19. Um, as we move to the third shell, there are two electrons in the S subshell and six in the P subshell. And then finally in the fourth shell, there's going to be just one electron left in the S subshell. When we write the notation, the first number is the shell. The letter that follows is the name subshell. And the superscript is the number of electrons in that subshell. And so you can see down here at the very bottom, <clears throat> we have all this written out, right? Where it's 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p to the sixth, 3s squared, 3p to the sixth, and finally 4s just to the first, okay? And if you add up all those uh, all those superscripts <clears throat> with the two, the two, the six, which gets us to 10, the two gets us to 12, that six gets us to 18, and then finally the one, where it's 4s to the first, that one gets us to 19 electrons. Okay, and then let's move on to uh, valence electrons. Okay, so the electrons in the outermost shell are called the valence electrons. These electrons are crucial to forming bonds with other atoms in chemical reactions. Most atoms want a valence of eight electrons, and this is known as the octet rule. Exceptions to the octet rule are helium, which has a full valence of two electrons, and hydrogen, which has one electron in its valence shell. Okay, so let's look. I believe we have a question on valence electrons. Right, so most atoms want a valence of blank electrons, right? And so that answer is eight. And again, that's known as the octet rule. If the outer shell is exactly at its full capacity of electrons, the atom is stable and will not react easily. If the outer shell of an atom is almost at its electron capacity, the atom will have a strong attraction for electrons in order to fill that orbital. However, if the outer <coughs> shell is nearly empty, the atom will release electrons relatively easily. So we just want to be familiar with how that works. It's fairly simple. Uh, with, when looking at atomic number and mass, the atap, atomic number is the number of protons. The number of protons is the number of electrons. And the mass of an atom is protons plus neutrons. Okay, so that obviously brings up the question is how do we find the number of neutrons? So the number of neutrons is the atomic mass minus the protons. So the atomic mass of the most common isotope is shown in the periodic table. For example, nitrogen is atomic number seven, 
and the mass of its most common isotope is 14, and therefore there are seven neutrons. All right, so as we look here at the periodic table, uh, periods are the different rows of elements. These periods are related to the shells of the electrons. As an example, potassium is in the fourth period and has an outermost shell of one electron, and therefore its valence configuration is 4s to the first. The different columns are called groups. An element in a group, all elements in a group, need the same number of electrons to compete, complete their outer shell. Therefore, they have similar properties. For example, all the elements in the far left column are metals and have just one electron in its valence shell and lose electrons with relative ease. So I think we have a question uh, on groups here, not metal groups specifically. Um, yes, the fourth bullet point, what group are all metals in? What properties do metals share? And as we just said, all the elements in the far left column, let's go back to the uh, periodic table. All elements in the far left column are metals and have just one electron in its valence shell and therefore all of those metals lose electrons with relative ease. On this periodic table, the higher the group number, the stronger the attraction for electrons. So fluorine, which is in group 17, is just one electron short of a complete shell. Therefore, fluorine has a strong attraction for electrons. Group 18, which is the furthest column to the right, are noble gases. So their outer shells are completely full. They react with other elements only under extreme conditions. And then we also want to get to uh, how do we estimate the number of isotopes, which is also a question for us. And so when we're trying to estimate the number of isotopes, just look at the atomic mass. If it's a decimal such as 79.9, .9, which is the atomic mass of bromine, then that number is averaged from more than one isotope. If we see an integer, which would be like a whole number, such as 19.0, then it's fair to assume that it comes from just one isotope. And so you can see that that was our last bullet point there. What information can you use to, <clears throat> to estimate the number of isotopes for a given element? And that's what we just said, is that you're looking at, is it a decimal or is it an integer? And that will give you uh, enough information to estimate. All right, so we've, that gets us to the end of this video. We have, we've gone through these six questions and answered them. Great thing to do now, hit that pause button, try to answer all these questions yourself. If you get stuck, go back in the video and uh, you can find the answer.